fellows and the senior executives about what life in organizations was like. And about the third year I was there, McGregor said, there's a company nearby that uh, wants to do a survey of their laboratory, so would you and Marv Shaw was my other young professor colleague, would you do this project for him and they will pay you. And that was not an insignificant incentive <laughs> as a <laughs> university professor to actually be paid to go out and do something. So we did that project, interviewed all the engineers, found out all their complaints, wrote a beautifully carefully crafted report, went to the laboratory director, presented it to him, he looked at the tabs, found the tab that was about him, <laughs> read it, and dismissed us. <laughs> so that was our, <laughs> our first experience with consulting. And to this day, I realize that either McGregor was deliberately doing this, or he was himself blind to how we didn't know why Dewey and Almy wanted to do this, we didn't know why the vice president wanted inexperienced professor <coughs> doing it. For all we knew, this was a setup to get his own lab director <laughs> in, you know, in a very elaborate way. Anyway, soon thereafter, and, and that'll be the, the, enough of the story, soon thereafter I got recruited by <clears throat> a former MIT administrator who had become the administrative assistant to Ken Olson at now seven-year-old Digital Equipment Corporation. And <clears throat> so I met Ken Olson. He thought it would be useful to have someone who knew about groups and communication just to sit in on their executive committee, their top management group. And that was a gift of incredible proportion. I did not come in to do anything. I came in to be part of the real work. And that's where I really got hooked. And from that point on, I worked for about 30 years with Dick and picked up other clients. But I still don't think of it as OD. I think of it as consulting and having learned process consultation. And OD is still, you know, those 35 books that Beckhard, Bennis, and I uh, edited. Uh, it's still, to me, not a coherent thing. Well, I uh, started my career as an industrial psychologist, uh, working at Procter and Gamble, and. Uh, had the intention that I would get four years of, or even more, of industrial experience before I went to teach. Academia was my, I had my sights on an academic job. <clears throat> uh, halfway through my four years at Procter & Gamble, I went to a, laboratory experience that was offered by the Society for Advancement of Management. <coughs> and five days later, I came away with scars in my eyes. Uh, I walked up to the trainer of our group and kind of like a puppy wagging my tail and said, this is Richard Wallen, um, said, do you think I could learn to do this sort of thing? He allowed us to He thought maybe I could. And from that time, I, my days at Procter & Gamble were numbered, not because <clears throat> that isn't a relevant place to do the kinds of things that we do in OD, but because they didn't have any time for tea groups at that time. And I just was so absolutely fascinated with what the, uh, what the process of being in a small group that within a short period of time transformed itself 
to the point where people could, well, where even if you didn't like a person in the group, somehow you loved them. And so I started looking around for a job uh, in academia and was recruited both by some folks at, uh, at Michigan and, and also Chris Archer at Yale. And uh, made a long list of pros and cons of going to one or the other, which came out exactly equal. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's quite a feat to have 20 items and get <laughs> 10 pluses on one side and 10 on the other. And then Chris called me and said, we'd really like you to come to Yale. And I said, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and it so happened that he had it in his power to nominate one of the first behavioral science interns at Bethel. And so I and Barry Ashri and Jerry Harvey and Doug Bunker and uh, a couple of other folks uh, became that first group. And that summer I spent, I think, 10 weeks in T groups. Facilitating, and being facilitated, and when I got to Yale, I was unfit for the college class. <laughs> All I wanted to do was to do two groups. <laughs> so I think, uh, and I continued to. Uh, to do them, but uh, not at Yale, and uh, I, you know, do weekend workshops or go on NTL labs, and that really became the significant part of my life, uh, the place where I really got nurtured and felt like I was using my best capacities. Uh, it was a wonderful time. Mm -hmm. Is it? Yeah, it is. Um, er everything I know about OD I learned in the streets. <laughs> so, I said everything I learned about OD I learned in the streets. Uh, in the 50s I got two journalism degrees, one from Illinois, one from Iowa. Uh, both schools of which were connection, have connections to the founders of OD, Kurt Lewin at Iowa. And, uh, Ken Betty and Lee Bradford at the University of Illinois, but I was not to learn that for many, many years. I had no idea about that legacy when I was a student. I spent uh, two years as a Navy journalist. I spent two years teaching journalism at Penn State University. And then, uh, and writing for magazines. I spent a good bit of the 50s and 60s writing for magazines and writing books. I was attracted to social psychology and education, and a lot of the articles I wrote for various magazines, most of which no longer exist, in the same way that most of the clients I consulted with no longer exist. <laughs> um, time does pass, and things change. Anyway, I, I uh, went into a family business in 19... 59, and started uh, graduate school at the University of Pennsylvania. I started working on a doctorate there. At least that's what I thought I was doing. And I spent almost 10 years in the family business. About halfway, th this was a uh, printing business. We were in the business forms manufacturing and mail order distribution business. And we sold these imprinted forms where you could buy a small quantity of forms and have your name and address printed on them, custom printed, 250 or 500. 
And one day my father came to me sometime in the mid 60s, it's his business, and said, I really would like to find a way to get the imprinting machine operators to go faster. So I heard about these incentive schemes, these, you know, and maybe we could put in an incentive scheme that would really make a difference. So I called up a friend of mine, not